Hey, it's Rob Fitzgerald. Uh, welcome back to another quick hits in lab medicine. Uh, I've got 10 slides to talk about laboratory diagnosis of pregnancy and just a brief introduction into prenatal analysis. Um, so the laboratory diagnosis of pregnancy is typically made by an immunoassay, and there's a couple of different kinds. One is a lateral flow device. That's what they sell in the pharmacies. Um, we're going to talk about how that works. Um, basically, they are detecting HCG, and in particular, they're picking up the beta subunit of HCG, chorion human chorionic gonadotropin. So it has an alpha and a beta subunit. Um, interestingly, LH, FSH, TSH, and HCG all, say, all share the same alpha subunit. So it's the beta subunit that gives them their, their biological effects. And for a long time, that's what was hard about diagnosis of pregnancy was getting an antibody that just reacted with the beta subunit. And uh, <clears throat> so we talk about pregnancy as being 40 weeks. And uh, when does that start? That clock actually starts before the pregnancy. It starts on the, the first day of the woman's last period. So that starts the clock. Um, if she gets pregnant, um, fertilization happens about two weeks after that. And on day five, the, uh, the fertilized egg implants into the uterus, and we start to see increases of HCG. And shortly thereafter, um, our quantitative laboratory tests can be positive. So the a positive result on our quantitative lab test is above five. Um, we also have quick tests in the lab that are a little bit more sensitive than the ones that are used in the pharmacy. And the reason for that is because many um, pregnancies spontaneously abort early on. And so um, the ones in the, in, in the uh, pharmacy really are, are designed to pick up a pregnancy after about four weeks. And so that's when the over-the-counter pregnancy tests become positive. Um, so HCG, um, what is, what's important about that is if you do a, a, an OCT, over-the-counter pregnancy test, you know positive or negative if you were um, pregnant or not. Um, what a quantitative value tells you is, is how much HCG is there, and that can be useful for monitoring the pregnancy because we want to see that the HCG is doubling every couple of days early on in the pregnancy. That, that is a, you know, the expected result is that we're going to see HCG increase um, throughout the first trimester. It's going to peak somewhere around 10,000 to 160,000 milli international units per mil. And again, the positive cutoff is five. So our, our assays are much more sensitive than that. But they're going to max out at about that at, at the end of the first trimester. And then the HCG is actually going to start to decrease. Um, if you have twins, um, another reason to do a quantitative serum is that you can, you know, see how much HCG is there. And typically, it doubles the amount uh, versus a, a single pregnancy, which, which sort of makes sense. Um, it's also useful in monitoring ectopic pregnancy. So an ectopic pregnancy is, is, a, is an implantation somewhere other than the uterus. It's not a viable pregnancy. And in that case, the HCG initially rises, but it doesn't continue to go up for that whole uh, first three months. Um, so it'll go up just a little bit, and then it'll start to come back down. And that's an indication that you might have an ectopic pregnancy. Um, it's also useful for trophoblastic disease. So in the case of a molar pregnancy, um, which there are several different forms, there's a partial mole, complete moles, and then there's trophoblastic disease. And trophoblastic disease is an invasive cancer. So the, uh, the, uh, the cancer is actually invading the uterus and uh, obviously needs to be um, surgically removed, and, and those patients also typically get chemotherapy. And so in that case, there, your HCG goes up, and it continues to go up. Um, and it goes so high, in fact, that with, with some trophoblastic disease, you can actually get hyperthyroidism. So as we remember, the alpha subunit are the same, and the beta subunits are what different. So HCG and TSH share some similarity. And if you get enough HCG, there's, there's cross-reactivity with the thyroid gland, and you can get hyperthyroidism. It's, it's sort of rare, but it, it, that does happen. So let's just talk a little bit about a home pregnancy test and, and what a sandwich immunoassay is. If you are in medicine, or in particularly if you're in the laboratory, you need to know what a sandwich immunoassay is. 
Um, so these are, uh, they're actually um, very sensitive and specific, um, but they need to be tested on the right population. So someone who is thinking they might be pregnant. Um, and as we said before, for these urine home tests, um, typically it becomes positive at week four or the day of the, the first missed period. Um, if it's negative, then the recommendation is you retest it, especially early on, because the HCG just might not be uh, high enough to be positive on the, uh, the, the uh, over-the-counter test. Um, they do turn negative, uh, and as we said, about 50% of conceptions are spontaneously aborted, and so that would be a case where you might see a positive one day and then the negative the next day, um, and again, might be an indication to be followed up with, with your OB. Um, so how does a sandwich immunoassay work? And so what we're going to talk about right now is a lateral flow device. So these are what's available. They're similar in uh, urine drug test um, <clears throat> there and, and some other uh, point-of-care diagnostic devices. But basically you have a, a piece of plastic that has a, uh, a strip that is uh, if you wet it by capillary action, fluid flows along the strip. And so what happens is that you have a well, and so here's our well, and in that well you add three drops of urine. Um, when you add three drops of urine, it dissolves some of the reagents that are in the well. And in particular, you have an anti-beta HCG. So this is an antibody against the beta subunit. That's what's going to make it specific for HCG. And um, combined with that antibody is colloidal gold, and I've shown that as a red dot. Colloidal gold, when gold is really finely milled, it actually looks purple, has a purple color. So I, I've labeled it red here, but this is going to be our, what we're going to visually see if we have HCG in the sample. Um, there's also a control antibody um, that has a, a blue color associated with it. And so if there's HCG in that sample, so we've drawn that as a diamond, this antibody is going to recognize that and it's going to bind to that. The lateral flow, the capillary action is going to wick these reagents along the, the, uh, the chromogenic strip. And at a, a certain part of the strip, there'll be a, whole, there'll be a line of anti-alpha HCG. And so these are antibodies that are impregnated in the membrane and the, so they're immobilized. And basically, we're going to call this the capture antibody, and we're going to call this the detection antibody. And so we are wicking along. We have HCG in our sample. It's combined with our beta HCG. And as it flows along, when it comes to that immobilized alpha antibody, the alpha subunit is going to stick. And we already have stuck the beta subunit that has that colloidal gold, which, as I mentioned, shows up as a purple color. And so that's going to give us a line on our, our pregnancy test. And that line is going to form a positive sign, and so that's going to be an indication of a positive test. Um, this control also is important. Um, it continues to flow past. It doesn't have any reason to stick because it's not against this antigen. But it is against this antigen that's impregnated and immobilized in the control area of the, uh, of the device. And so properly, if properly conducted, we should get a positive control as a blue signal and a purple line for um, a positive uh, pregnancy test. So in a very similar manner, um, this is a pregnancy test with a negative outcome. So we did the same thing. We add three drops of urine to the well. It dissolves the reagents. Um, and we have anti-beta HCG, and we have our control sample. In this case, we don't have any, any, any of the triangle, which was the HCG, so capillary action is going to wick this along. There's no meat, so there's no, if you're a vegetarian, there's no vegetables to make a sandwich. Um, you have two slices of bread, so the anti-HCG is one slice of bread. The anti-beta HCG is the other slice of bread. We've got nothing to stick those two pieces of bread together, and so we don't get the purple line here. However, our control line does flow over. It binds to its antigen, and we get a positive control so that we know that antigen-antibody reactions are possible in that sample, and we just didn't have any HCG or there wasn't enough to, to cause a positive result. So a sandwich immunoassay really combines two different antibodies to two different epitopes, and one is typically the capture, the other is the detection, and together they give you a very specific assay. 
So briefly, uh, talk about hemolytic disease of the fetus and, new, and newborns. Um, this is due to RH and ABO in, uh, incompatibilities. So um, basically what happens is if, uh, if, a, if a baby is uh, D positive and the mom is, is, is D negative, um, then her first pregnancy, she will likely be exposed to some of the antigen. She'll form antibodies, and in a second pregnancy, those antibodies will cross the placenta and cause cell lysis. And so the most severe form is urethroblastosis fatalis, and, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, so as I said, uh, a rho D negative mom has a rho D positive fetus. Um, the mom can form antibodies against that, and if she does, those antibodies will cross the placenta, cause lysis of fetal red cells. When you lyse red cells, um, you form uh, bilirubin, and in this case, the bilirubin is unconjugated because the fetal liver is not developed enough to conjugate it. Unconjugated bilirubin is lipophilic. It crosses the blood-brain barrier um, and can cause kernicterus. And so that's a neurotoxicity. Um, interesting uh, mechanism to prevent this is called ROGAM. And essentially um, what it does is that it gives mom some of these antibodies so that if the fetal cells do cross, she doesn't have to develop a full-blown reaction. She already has antibodies that bind and cover that antigen so that her immune system doesn't develop her own antibodies, which would typically overwhelm. So it's passive immunity. So we just give enough of it to coat the, the few red cells that cross and, mom, and prevent mom from developing her own antibodies. So diagnosis of uh, heredity of uh, fetal hemoglobin uh, lysis due to RHO incompatibilities. Um, there's a couple of things that can be done. Um, it used to be, uh, it was commonly done, amniotic fluid was, they looked for um, lecithin and sphingomyelin. Today they do more just type and, and screen, and so what does that mean? So, so typing just means um, figuring out if mom is uh, rho negative. Um, if she is, um, rho negative, then she could develop antibodies against a rho positive uh, fetus. Um, and then also screening says, did she actually develop antibodies? And so type says, you know, what is her blood type? Screen says, did she develop antibodies? Um, and then you can actually um, see how much uh, antibodies are there with a indirect Coombs test. So a positive indirect Coombs test says that she has antibodies and that would potentially put the fetus at risk for, uh, for kernicterus. So urethroblastosis fatalis is the most severe form of uh, these incompatibilities. Um, and as we said, normally you have a small amount of unconjugated bilirubin as the fetus comes to term, that typically decreases um, if you have erythroblastosis fatalis and mom's antibodies are lysing the fetus's red cells, you get an increase towards the end of the term, and that's where you can get um, kernicterus. Um, so you're lysing the red cells, you're forming bilirubin, it's unconjugated bilirubin, it saturates the albumin, which is normally its, its, uh, its binding protein, and you have free um, unconjugated bilirubin that crosses the blood-brain barrier and causes neurotoxicity, which is what we're trying to prevent when we do a type and screen and <clears throat> um, uh, a ROGAM administration. So that's a, a, a quick introduction to uh, laboratory diagnosis of pregnancy and a few uh, diseases of, of the newborn. Thanks for paying attention.